In an ordeal spanning a decade, the illustrious city of Troy succumbed to the relentless might of the Greeks and passed into myth. Prince Aeneas led the survivors on a quest to found a new homeland. After battling fate and the gods, the Trojans arrived in Italy. Ascanius, the son of Aeneas, ruled as king in a town he founded, Alba Longa. A line of kings ensued, most of whom accomplished nothing. 300 years go by, and by the early 8th century BC, this line of kings reached two brothers, Numitor, who was the firstborn, and Amulius. Numitor became king, but Amulius, ambitious and greedy, usurped his brother and killed his male heirs. Amulius also forced Numitor's daughter, Rhea Silvia, to become a vestal virgin so she could not marry or have children. Although Rhea was not supposed to remain a virgin, she was seduced by the god Mars and they had twin sons. Amulius couldn't kill the boys without attracting the wrath of Mars, so he ordered a servant to do away with them by leaving them to suffer in the elements. When the servant reached the river Tiber, he could not throw them in. He looked down at the infants sitting together in the basket, their tiny arms wrapped around one another, and thought about his own young sons. Instead, he placed the basket in the river and let the current carry it in the hopes that someone would see the twins and rescue them. A compassionate she-wolf came across the basket in the river and pulled the babies to safety. The wolf cared for the twins and protected them from dangers such as other wild animals. A friendly woodpecker helped the boys to find food. Soon, a kindly shepherd happened to stumble across the twins. He took the brothers back home, out of the howling winds of the night, to his wife in their cosy cottage. They decided to call the boys Romulus and Remus. The shepherd and his wife raised the children as if they were their own. The twins grew up to become shepherds like their father. One day, while the boys were herding their sheep, they came across a group of men sworn to Amulius. This group started a fight with the brothers and Remus was captured by the shepherds and taken to King Amulius. Romulus managed to escape and raised a force to rescue his beloved brother. King Amulius believed that Rhea Silvia's children were dead, so had no reason to suspect that this was his grand nephew. Romulus managed to save his brother and in the process killed King Amulius. Numitor, the rightful king of Alba Longa, was returned to his throne. But now what was to be done with these headstrong youths? They were eager for political power, but with the restoration of their grandfather as king, that was not on offer at Alba Longa. However, the population in the kingdom was growing, and there were enough adventurers to build a new settlement. Numitor was happy to send the ambitious youths away and task the twins with founding this city. The brothers decided that the group of hills on the Tiber would be an ideal place for their city. The ford would allow those who controlled it to manage traffic going up and down the western plain. The brothers decided that, as a start, they would fortify one of the hills, but they could not agree on which one. Romulus opted for the Palatine and Remus the neighbouring Aventine. They agreed to wait for a sign from the gods to determine which hill they would fortify. Remus saw the sign of six vultures first, while Romulus claims to have seen twelve. Each claimed that they had won. Against the wishes of his brother, Romulus began to build a wall around the Palatine. Remus, in a fury, jumped over the walls that Romulus was building to prove to Romulus how weak his walls were. The brothers began to fight. The fighting got out of hand and Romulus killed Remus. After some time, he had realized what just happened. He had founded his new state on a crime. For Romans in the dying years of the Republic, this was a fearful anticipation of the fratricidal civil wars that led to the decimation of Rome's ruling class. Filled with grief and remorse, Romulus lost all desire for life, at least for a while. Ambition returned, and on April 21, 753 BC, he finally built his city on the hill, and he named it Rome, and he became their first king. Rome had an initial population of around 3,000 Latins. If Romulus was to create a viable society, one not only able to defend itself, but also to supply the necessary labor to build the city, he would need more people. One of his first policies addressed this lack of people. 
he opened up citizenship for foreigners, and anyone who wanted to live in Rome could simply show up. In the early days, though, this had the unfortunate side effect of attracting an assortment of the rabble. Soon enough, there were not enough women to go around. Something urgent had to be done to achieve a one-to-one -one gender balance. Romulus devised a plan. He announced that he would throw lavish games and that all the surrounding communities were invited to join them. Once a large number of people had gathered to enjoy the spectacle, not just Romans but also members of the neighboring Sabine communities, the king took his seat on the throne. This was the signal his hidden warrior were waiting for, and a large force of hidden Romans leapt out of hiding and kidnapped all the unmarried Sabine women. The men were allowed to escape. The Sabines were understandably enraged and chose to send an embassy to Rome to ask for the return of their women. Romulus refused but offered a counter-proposal that marriages between Romans and Sabines should be allowed. The Sabines rejected this offer and sent an army under Titus Tatius. They beat the Romans in a number of battles and captured Rome's citadel on the Capitoline Hill. The Romans withdrew to the Palatine Hill and as the battle was set to continue, an extraordinary thing happened. The captured Sabine women came rushing onto the battlefield from every direction. Although they had been captured and forced to marry, they accepted their fate and this put an end to the war. The Romans and Sabines signed a treaty, acknowledging that the Sabine women were treated honorably and all who wished to maintain their marriages were allowed to do so, and most of the women elected to stay. Romulus then proposed an even more radical policy. He offered that the Romans and Sabines merge their two states. All Sabines would be awarded Roman citizenship and equal rights. Tatius would become co-ruler along with Romulus. This arrangement lasted for five years, after which Tatius died and Romulus once again became sole ruler. He boasted of a number of achievements. Romulus established the basic outline of the Roman state. The king, later the consuls, commanded the army and was advised by a committee, the Senate. Members were drawn from leading families of Rome and became known as the patrician class. In addition to their advisory and legal roles, they also enjoyed religious privileges. It was they who organized the interregnum that inevitably followed the death of a king and organized the election of a successor. Estates in the ancient Mediterranean were not kingdoms. They tended to be direct democracies, where all citizens met to debate policy, one man having one vote, or they were aristocracies, where a small ruling class managed affairs of state. Often enough, they moved violently from one type of government to another. Centuries later, a Greek historian living in Rome named Polybius would write volumes on why Rome came to eclipse all other states in the Mediterranean. In a circular process he called anacyclosis, Polybius theorizes that each of the three systems of governance concealed its corrupted form. Monarchy usually devolved into tyranny, aristocracy into oligarchy, and democracy, which he thought the most dangerous system of all, inevitably collapses into mob rule. Polybius attributes Rome's longevity to its mixed constitution. The Romans combined all three systems – democracy in the form of elections, aristocracy in the form of the senatorial class, and monarchy in the king, later consuls. Romulus also set the tone for military aggression that Rome would become famous or infamous for as he was a vigorous and capable commander. Rome was nearly always at war during his reign and he extended the city's territory substantially while managing to grow its population. In public, he usually presented himself wearing a crown and carried a scepter with an eagle on the top. In the 37th year of his reign, the king went to the Campus Martius, an open space north of the Capitoline, and held a military review. A storm suddenly appeared with thunderclaps and lightning streaking the sky. A thick mist formed and Romulus disappeared. When the fog cleared, he was nowhere to be found. The senators who were present were perplexed by this, but soon enough, all present hailed him as divine. Kingship in Rome was not hereditary, but an elected position. It was a gift of the People's Assembly along with input from the Senate. Most of Rome's seven kings were not related to one another and were also foreigners. This had the fortuitous effect of removing senators from competition, which stabilized it as an institution. Rome 
was at a crossroads. Romulus had built a strong foundation for future growth, but could the Romans keep it going? <laughs>